bad music. It's soothing. I bet you know who composed this I absolutely do know who composed this song. His name is Nobuo Uematsu. I'm probably butchering that pronunciation. And he's done the music for a lot of these games. Mm -hmm. And this is this particular sound that we're hearing right now. This little da 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 is the only piece of music that repeats through every single Final Fantasy. And this is Final Fantasy VI, now we're at 13 or something like that. But, um, I love this little piece of music. It's almost like, reminds me of like Philip Glass. It's pretty, yeah. It's really low. And then this comes in these like little stringy type sounds or whatever flute you would call it. Here we are. I'm Johnny Jungle Guts and this is Let's Gay, episode three. Wait, what is your what is your podcast called? Let's gay. <laughs> let's gay. Oh, because all the people on the internet are doing let's plays, and I'm trying to gay it up. I'm let's gay Final Fantasy VI, and I'm, I'm here today so with Lauren White. You chose me. I'm so honored to have you here. Lauren White is a comedian and a filmmaker. Now let's talk about that, because you went to school for film I and did. then have sw shifted to comedy. How did that become a... Could, how did that shift happen? Do I need to have this on? No, we absolutely don't. I'm finding it very distracting. Oh, take it <laughs> off. Um, so I studied film in school, and I made films for a bit, and then when I left school without the structure of an institution, I, I just immediately stopped making films. And for a long time, I really beat myself up about that. Yeah. But then I started getting these other opportunities to perform and act in things, and I, act, I was in a feature that was like a really incredible experience, and afterwards I was like, oh, this is really what I think I should be doing. Uh, and I haven't ruled out filmmaking, but I think I want to use acting and performance art and comedy as a way to eventually make my own content and write direct. Yes, but we do do that to ourselves. I mean, I went to school for art, yeah. and I now I'm pretty much just doing, you know, nerdy organizing, podcasts and interviews, and for a while I did think to myself, why am I not drawing? Why, why am I not making visual object items, or doing something that would more typically be considered performance art, but yeah. we do do that to ourselves with our, our degrees and our backgrounds yeah. in sort of an unnecessary way. Yeah. It's like just an, another way to sort of like yell at yourself. And but I think you do a lot of stuff. Like you've consistently drawn animals all the time. And not that consistent. I probably haven't really done well, I've probably done a little here and there, but I haven't been drawing animals a lot in the last couple years, I would say. I mean, unless you consider Pokémon to be animals. I mean, that's a whole other conversation, I but do. You do. Now, you said you were in a feature that really uh, sort of affected you and made you want to um, keep doing acting. What uh, was that project? It's called Present Company Excluded, and it's directed by a CalArts alum, Jenny Hachidorian, and produced by her husband, Aaron Murtaugh, who I continue to uh, collaborate with on stuff. And, uh, and it was really special. She just came to me out of the blue, like three and a half years ago and was like, hey, I wrote this script and I want you to be in it. And I read her script and I was like, oh my god! And I got very excited and I said, of course I will do this. And I quit my job and slash I got fired from my job. Okay. And then we shot all over Los Angeles for two weeks and it was like, it was pretty incredible. And Sounds incredible. Very recently, they, we completed the film about a year ago and then very recently we've begun, begun screening at different places. Uh, and that was really cool. We had a screening in LA three weeks ago, and a ton of my friends came, and a ton of people who worked on the film came, and uh, it played at this strange little theater called the Bellevue Theater. And uh, I think every, and it was great. I really, it was the second time I'd seen it, and the first time I saw it, I had like a lot of uncomfortable feelings. Yeah. Where I was like, oh my god. Like, you're, you're very big on screen. Like, you are large. And that was hard to watch, but also I was like, I thought I had done a terrible job. And then I watched it again, and I was like, oh, I'm actually really proud of this performance. It's kind of singular and weird, and I think I'm really a character. But the first time I saw it, I just saw myself acting and was really not pleased with anything I was doing. Which I think kind of ties back into like, I don't know, unschool school you. Yeah. Now, uh, what was the premise of this film? It's about this young woman who I interpret as being queer, but I don't think that's how Jenny wrote it, but that's like what I try and do and everything. And, <laughs> and she's... Let's gay! Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and she's... Uh, 
she's she's having this. She's just graduated. She's working in a foundry where she like makes sculptures. So she like like bronze sculptures for people's yards. Mm -hmm. So she's like a foundry worker, and she is trying to figure out like what she wants to be. And she sort of decides that she wants to have this romantic adventure um, with her next door neighbor, who was her childhood best friend. And they're uh, a wealthy family and a really strange family. And so she spends this one summer kind of bent on getting in with them. And it's about what goes down in like a 72 hour period where she tries to go to their 4th of July party. And you're the star of the picture. I am, yeah. Oh my gosh. And where did this screen? Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's at the Bellevue Theater here. Uh huh. And at a couple other film festivals whose names have escaped me. Oh, cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. And you also do uh, comedy now to an improv, even. I so do. you've really gotten you've really gotten into acting. I have, yeah. Yeah. I've been doing improv since school, but um, I encouraged my mentor at school and the woman who led the institute wide course, Sally Merkel. I was like, hey. I hate UCB because it's all straight guys who are like, my girlfriends love me. And oh, it was, boy. It was more, yeah, it was bad. It was bad. So I was like, please teach something because I miss you and I miss the way that you teach and I want to find like a space to do improv that's not like entirely dominated by white guys. And so we started our, we started, well, she started, you know, I encouraged her. She started this class and it developed over the last like three or four years. And now it's all girls and it's called Girl Crush. And we teach a workshop at the Women's Center for Creative Work. And then we perform there regularly. And it's been really fun. It's, mm -hmm. been, it's been really, yeah, it's very, it's very exciting. But let's talk about this. There's a revenge comedy, I would almost call it, that happens sometimes in, in stand-up where people take things out on their ex-significant others. What is that about? Have you seen that before? Because I feel like I've seen that a lot. I, like in improv? I mean, it's what you were, it's almost what you were talking about. The, the, the guys come in and they talk about how much their women, you said it was about how much their women love them, is what like you were Like guys heard. in these improv classes would just, they would come in with like, so much confidence about how funny they were. And okay. I would, and I would always be funnier than them, so it drove me crazy. And uh, and and they would like I felt like the their the basis for them like finding themselves really talented was just like my girlfriend thinks I'm hilarious. Oh, I see uh, what you're but saying. But it wasn't necessarily like I was brought in, but always in in exercises or in work like at in UCP in particular, which I'm not trying to hate on. Like they do plenty of great things, but. Uh, but I just didn't have good experiences in the classes I was in. And it was like mainly white guys and I was like, fuck this. So anyway, that whenever we do exercises, like you always get kind of pushed into these roles where you're like someone's girlfriend or like someone's sex object or someone's mother. Okay. Like you're never, you're never in a scene with a guy where they don't like make Like I would make them my bitch, or I would come like if they try if they tried to put me in a role like that, I would turn it on its head and be like, "Well, we're both firemen, actually," uh -huh. which is something you're not supposed to do in improv. You're not supposed to be firemen. No, you're not supposed you're not supposed to be like when I have this joke with my friend where we'd be really bad where where we be <laughs> where we're really bad improvisers with each other mm -hmm. and like somebody suggests something and you're like that's funny you just said that we're in a forest because actually we're clearly in my room right yeah that's what you're not <laughs> supposed to you're supposed to roll with it in improv you're supposed to say yes and anyway so we started this other group because I was like I can't do this any longer and it's great. It's been really fun. Mm -hmm. we have a, lot of, a lot of girls show up. It's open to boys too, uh, but it's been mainly women who. Take and this our is class. Girl Crush. Yeah, yeah. And it's at the Women's Center for Creative That's Work. That's right. Do you want to talk a little bit about the Women's Center for Creative Work and the kind of stuff they do, just briefly? I, I wish I was. More not. You don't feel yeah, knowledgeable enough. Yeah, I don't. Enough. I don't, and I don't want to speak like a representative of the work they do because they do a ton of a stuff. A ton of stuff. And I know I'm only a part. I'm only a small part of it. Um, but they are sort of like an enormous resource for community building and they do a lot mm -hmm. in the neighborhood in the surrounding area of Frogtown and they do a lot of performance-based work and they bring in artists and they bring in speakers and they bring in, and then they have like a bunch of fun classes and so mm -hmm. it'll be like knit and watch a movie 
but that's not a class, that's an activity. Or sure. they have like a collage night, or they mm -hmm. do all kinds of stuff. So that's a fun place, and you know, I think every, you know, go, go. Oh, I'd love to go there. I went there for my Did friend Guan's, uh, had an art show there, and then also, uh, they, uh, they, uh, did a talk on Wonder Woman there that was really cool. I... On what? Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman. Oh, yeah, of course. Who I'm wrapping right now with this lovely little yeah. tiara headpiece. Okay, I have a real question about yeah. it. Do you ever wash that? No, I tend to just buy new ones. Because <laughs> I don't really know <laughs> how to wash, to wash it. It's hard to wash. It's, it's, it's definitely a costume item, so I'm not really sure. Where do you get them? I, okay, I got the Wonder Woman costume, the first Wonder Woman costume from a lady from eBay. And it was so magnificent because the, uh, the, the posting on eBay said, the, the title was Wonder Woman Sexy Drag Stripper Ooh. Erotic, um, Nightwear, like, it, Wonder really Woman. Really taking advantage Wonder Woman, of potential it, buzzwords. Buzzwords. Yeah. Wonder Woman encompassed almost any situation <laughs> in the title of the item, of, in the yeah, title of yeah. this Ensemble, it sort of was everything, you know? Wonder yeah. Woman could be anything through all these different uh, modes. So I, I bought it from this very nice lady who made it for me custom in, uh, and I think she was somewhere down south. She was so nice. And she and fast, too. Because I, <laughs> I originally got it for a graduation performance at our college graduation, and uh, I uh, needed it in about a week. I had to, uh, to get it together, and she got it right to me. Now, let's talk about uh, comedians just a little bit more. I've heard people say, uh, or make the case that, you know, tragedy and comedy are very similar and all this type of stuff, and comedians are sort of like, a, a lot of comedians are sort of a little bit damaged. Would you agree to that? Absolutely. You would agree to yeah. it. You would agree to it. As for myself, yes. And, and probably a lot of other people. Yeah, yeah. And what is that, what is that, where does that urge, like... I don't know. I always think this this is kind of a cliche question. I saw an interview with Joan Rivers where she was laughing at the fact that people always asked her, right. "What makes you what makes you funny?" You know, like in this really like heavy way, like yeah. what makes you funny? What happened to you to make you funny? Yeah, yeah. And Joan Rivers is just like, "I'm just so shallow," which I think is not even quite true. But yeah, yeah. Uh, that she thought that was a ridiculous question. But what what is it that drives people to want to want to make uh, uh, tons of people laugh? Do you think? Oh, I think I have, like, a clinical problem where I need an amount of attention that's absolutely unhealthy. Yes. And yes. I felt that way. That's something I've known about myself since I was, like, four years old. Mm -hmm. I was like, this shit is crazy how much I need people to pay attention to me. Um, but also, I had three sisters, and I was, like, when you have a lot of siblings, like, you get overshadowed easily, or, like, everybody has to be identified in this certain way, like, and my sisters were, like, really athletic and popular oh, athletic. And, and I so I got to be the one that like read a lot and was funny so that was part of what molded it and also uh, I need a lot of attention and focus so that comes out of it and I think like I'm not necessarily saying this for myself because it's a little melodramatic but I think people develop a strong sense of humor or like that kind of like the a willingness to really laugh at themselves in the world when as a, as a survival tactic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I feel like some people come from really damaged places, so they um, that's how they survive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting because I am also a very loud person, but I don't think I developed it until high school. I remember I got an <laughs> award when I was in eighth grade. Uh, they gave awards to everyone in the class, and my award was for being a silent leader. I was a silent leader. Is that true? That's true. And at that point, you weren't loud. I was not loud. I Where so, did that even come I was from? still manipulative. <laughs> I was manipulative, but I wasn't loud. Gemini. Yeah. But now I'm just as loud as can possibly be. I kind of it kind of annoys me how much I am that same way. I need and crave attention. Um, I have to embrace it as a, like, a good thing about myself. I don't know. I have to, I have to just get over it. Get over it. It's fine. We mm -hmm. need a lot of attention. Some people need drugs. I don't. And yeah. that's, so that's better. Um, I don't some do people drugs. need mm -hmm. your 
desk would suggest otherwise. I don't do drugs. I don't <laughs> like the taste, you know? <laughs> But some people need drugs. Now, let's talk about this. You've got three sisters. I also have three sisters. I didn't know that. Isn't that a funny coincidence? Yeah. And where did you grow up? I grew up um, in Los Angeles. I was I lived here till I was nine, and then my mom and my sister, my biological sister and I moved up to uh, Northern California. To okay. Monterey Bay. We moved to a town that is literally called Butterfly Town, USA. And what is the vibe of Butterfly Town, USA? Uh, it's a small Methodist town. Methodist. It was, at the time, pretty conservative, and I think, like, middle class to upper middle class. It's right next door to Carmel, in Carmel Valley, and those are very... Carmel, in particular, is a very wealthy place. Um, and it has the aquarium, and... Um, yes, the legendary aquarium. You, you probably know about the monarchs and their migrational patterns, but they end up in Pacific Grove. Okay. At some point. I don't know, they go to... They, like, they're, you know, they're real travelers. They go, okay. to, they go to Mexico, and I think they go through... Canada, oh, yeah, that's true, yeah, they and do. And then they end up back in our town, and that's where they sort of live out the rest of their days. Yeah, yeah. It's a great, it, it is actually a retirement community, so that makes sense for them, too. Oh, my goodness. And it's a place where deer roam freely, but they're sort of gross deer. Um, How are they gross? They're just, they're like, um, rugged. They're like, they're, they have, like, busted coats. They're yes. not like spotted fawns. They're just, they're, yeah. I mean, they maybe yeah. Who knows what's really going on? The who knows what's really going on with them? Also, a lot. There's a raccoon infestation there, so a lot of raccoons. But I love raccoons. They're cute. So I've always been very happy about that. Yeah. Um, sometimes a raccoon will let you feed it, and that's a really good experience. Mm -hmm. um, but you don't really want to do that because then they are habituated to people, right? That's so what it's not happens really good in to our do. town. They, yeah. That's why there's so many. They just they just glom they have onto you. So much trash and so many. It's a huge tourist destination. So like people will like pour out of buses on the coast and then they'll feed the raccoons. Who? Well, I don't know. The raccoons are not out during the day. I don't know what goes on with the raccoons. They're breeding like crazy. It's gangbusters. Okay, so you're in butter. What is it? Butterfly Town. Butterfly Town. Butterfly Town. Town. We're in Butterfly Town. What kind of school are we going to? I went to public school. Public school. There. Yeah. And talk about that, because I went to private school and... Was it private Catholic school? No, it was private Quaker school, which basically means it's like a hippie utopia. Is your utopia. family Quakers? No. My family recognized, though, that the best private schools in our area were of Quaker South schools. Jersey were Quaker schools. So that is mm. why we ended up with that Quaker uh, background. Um, but... My family was not Quaker. I practiced Quaker for a little while uh, afterwards. Our, our neighbors in Pacific Grove that lived across the street from us were Quaker. And my mom always, I think, felt very fearful of judgment, even though that's not at all what they're about. But we would have, like, in, like the worst of times with my mom and my sister and I, like, we'd scream in the street. Like, we were those neighbors. <laughs> Why would you scream in the street? Because I would get, I wanted to, because I, I was terrible. I wanted to, when I was mad at my mom, I would seek to humiliate her. Oh my she, gosh. Because she would, like, make choices that didn't make, I, I won't show her this podcast. She would make choices that made, that made me very angry. Whatever, I was a fucking country You're a little kid. Girl. You, yeah. Just, whatever. Um, I was so, a horrible child in some ways. I was too. Yeah. I mean, my parents definitely feel that way about me. So some of it, I think, is like I've internalized their opinion. But also, I do think I was kind of a horrible kid. I mean, I I used to not speak to my dad if he wouldn't buy me the toys that I wanted. That was what I was doing. <laughs> like, I was pulling that kind of I stuff. I didn't smile in my parents' wedding picture because they wouldn't buy me rubber ducks from the hotel guest shop. Guest store? Gift store? Kids are brutal. Kids are brutal, and they expect, they expect, uh, I don't know, maybe it's something with our generation, but I felt like, as a child, I just expected my mom to just, just wait on me hand and foot, let's be honest. I was so manipulative, I was such a manipulative little boy, and my mom would say, my dad would say, Johnny, you're manipulating me, and I'd say, I don't know what that means. Oh, that's such a scary answer. Yeah. That's a psycho answer. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I was bad. But, so you would scream at your mom in the street for making choices that were, like, not I even that big of a deal. I was just being a bratty 14, 15-year-old, mm. and we would get in fights, and my mom was a yeller, too. Everyone in my family are big yellers. Yeah. And so, and I would, like, bring it into the street, and she'd be like, they can hear us! You know, so there was a fear that the Quakers didn't... Anyway, go back to Quakers. And so, uh... 
Well, but basically all I was saying was Quaker school was like a hippie utopia. So was public school really just hell for you or? No, I think I went like, I went to, I didn't get the kind of encouragement or the kind of like education that would have, I think, helped put me on a track towards the arts or I, I don't know. Like clearly that was the only thing I was, I excelled in at all was like performing and writing and I didn't go to a school that saw that, like, recognized it, and was able to, like, in, like, kind of nurture it. Nurture it, uh, yeah. And I think, like, I would have, I think I would have, uh, I wished I'd had that. I had a really great mentor who was my English teacher, who was also the drama teacher, mm -hmm. and, like, and he was, like, uh, a wonderful person in my life who helped sure. direct me. But I, I mean, so yeah, so, but it wasn't like a hellish public, it was just like a really... You know, it was like a, a nice community. Everyone was very nice, and I didn't have like this typical high school experience where because I wasn't popular, I had a terrible time. And then, but at some point, you got interested in film, filmmaking. Yeah, my sister. So my sister is a professional skateboarder, and she was traveling around the world and skating. And then she would film all of her friends, and she would make movies. She'd make the skate videos for all of them. Mm -hmm. And then I would sit in the back of a room with a bunch of boys and her and just watch them watching the videos they'd made. And I became, like, really transfixed with what what she made. Like, I loved that she would put music to this motion and that it would be, like, really hypnotic. And mm -hmm. I liked, I loved watching her work, and I also just thought that it was really badass. So I expressed interest, and she let me start using her camera. And then my dad got me a Super 8 camera, so I started working first in film. And I would wow. like just get high with my friends and go to Carmel Valley, and we'd like film ourselves like walking through old houses and and. Um, sort of a non-linear narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which yeah. is how you probably and got into Cal Arts. My, and then for my senior project, I made a movie about. Um, purchasing weed for my grandma who's dying of cancer and then like us and then I just sort of shot us getting high together and talking a little bit and it was like sort of my goodbye movie to her and I think I think that was something that I submitted to CalArts and then I made this other like long kind of video poem yeah so like it was shot on film and it was non-linear and it was sort of poetic and I'm really surprised I got in I really am I don't think my work no, was that strong at I all I think what you just described to me is super CalArtsy though sorry I'm trying to open this window um also I know I wrote a horrible essay. I talked about Jurassic Park in my essay, but not that I had anything interesting to contribute, like, to a conversation about oh, Jurassic Park. It was I'm just nervous. bad. It was bad. I'm very surprised. But they let in some other people in our class, and everyone was like, hmm? How bad? I remember... I remember being so confident I was going get, to get into CalArts. And, which is funny, because I didn't get into a lot of other schools I applied to, and then I didn't go to CalArts because it was too pretentious for me, and then I just dropped out of the other art school I went to. Where were you? Savannah College of Art and Design, which is totally boring. It's like a for-profit art school. I don't know anything about art school. Anyway, so anyway, uh, and then I didn't, and then I reapplied to CalArts and Hampshire College, and I didn't get into Hampshire, so I had to go to CalArts, and that was just how I ended up at Ca CalArts. Do you think it ended up being the best Absolutely, I, I really, I really you, ended up liking it. Yeah, to me, you feel like a really, you're somebody that really stood out to me, and I also feel like you're someone who really took advantage of your experience there. Like oh, you're yeah. always doing stuff, and you're always being, uh, putting yourself out there. And, trying and to get the attention. Happen. It's That's the attention getting. But, a, but, I mean, but there's a good side to yeah, it, too. Yeah. Is what you're saying is it that it's not bad. Community. It's not necessarily no. a bad thing. It could, yeah. it could build you're, a community. It could build a community. So what kind of filmmaking were you doing at school? Though I know a little bit of the answer to this question, but tell us a little bit about Wait, no, that. Tell, for, me what you, tell me your answer to the question. Because I'm... Well... Because I, like, I don't feel like I ever showed anyone my work. Actually, now that I think about it... I mean, maybe you saw things like James and I made together, or that I helped him with? Yeah, like I remember, yeah, you were... I remember you helping on that movie, but I think it was actually Temra's movie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where I was saying. Did that movie ever get made? I don't... I think No, I know she completed it, but I don't know what happened with yeah. it. Yeah. We, we spent a lot of time on that. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what happens. Yeah. With film, film projects, they... They're a little heartbreaking. Yeah. You can put a lot of yourself into it, and then, like, maybe you lose a hard drive, which I think is part of what may have happened there. Oh, okay. I've lost a hard drive before, and it, like, will... Just, it just ruins the it'll whole... It'll ruin you. Ruins the whole situation. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
Uh, I was I was really just learning what I wanted to make because I'd had so little experience already making films. I didn't have a voice or an idea of what I wanted to do. And I remember um, I was I did like a little. I think for my thesis project was a narrative short about basically about my mom and my sisters and I, but sort of like played out to an extreme. And I wrote like really fun characters for that, and uh, I never finished it, which I still like sort of plagues me. And the work that I did, and then I did a lot of sort of like um, documentary where I played a little bit between things that were scripted and things that were uh, documented. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was, yeah, I, I think I did mainly work that was like, um, like I'd, I'd spend some time with my mom and then I'd put, and then I would sort of film these conversations with us. Okay. Uh, but it, I wouldn't, I wasn't actually, there was like a bit of something being like maybe voyeuristic, like. I made a piece where I where I filmed her talking late at night while watching TV, but it's I'm just shooting her bird who's walking back and forth across the room because my mom's yeah. a bird lady. Oh, she is. She has a lot of pet birds. She just has one. Just one. What kind of bird? She's is gone it? through a couple. It's a conure. It's a green conure. Okay. Um, do those talk? What are those? Do? I mean, they're supposedly smart or charming, but I don't see it in this bird at mm -hmm. all. Yeah. Yeah, they do some talking. Um, my mom will always be like. She says Obama. She says Obama. And I'm like, mm, no, she doesn't. She doesn't say, say that. Obama. And her name is Sophie. And uh, and then, it, like, whenever it sort of suits the situation, she'll be like, she says Christmas tree. It's crazy. That's and I'll be like, crazy. She doesn't say Christmas tree. She just says, Sophie. Mm hmm. Uh, now, yeah. what were you. Who. You, so really you, got, you're you talked so about Jurassic Park. Right what. This. Um. What were Phil? I mean, well, I'm learning. You know, it's kind of like mind control a little bit doing yep. podcasts. I mean, mind control is a strong word. So but far, you, I feel very manipulated. Yeah, but you kind of have to guide. You kind of have to guide it along. Yeah. You know? you kind well, of you stay to, on track very well. I'm, I kind of I'm can't believe better. how how much you could pay attention to things because like While I'm playing this video games. and this is very distracting to me. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I feel like it's been. It hasn't been to the benefit of this episode. No, no, no. I feel like you don't want to talk about this at all. <laughs> no, you're really not interested. I so don't I have <laughs> anything to say about this. I mean, what I've, like, I just don't, I don't know if I care about any of this. No, characters. you don't care about any, I don't well, blame you. Well, I like you. that the monsters stand. Yes. I like that they don't actually attack. Yeah. I mean, it it's seems a weird kind of easy. Like, you're just like, arrows. It's sort of like chess. The way that it, yeah, the game totally. is played. It's not a. Uh, it's not about uh, small motor skills like say Mario Brothers would be. Do you have any? What were like? What was your like childhood relationship to video games? Like were your parents okay with it? Did they let you have it? Did they not let you have it? Dad's house, no video games. No, no, no. There were, but we had like really limited screen time. Mom's house, there were video games, and it was a little looser. My and it was again like I just watched my sisters do things, right. and then when they'd leave the room, I'd like quietly teach myself how to play them. But I never wanted to go up against them because I wasn't very good. But okay. I loved I loved Donkey Kong. Yes. Um, and I found uh, when he's in the coal shoot, that was a real thrill for me. The uh, he's on a cart, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really amazing. That's a really fun level. And I got really, I really thought, I always thought the idea of bosses was really funny. Mm -hmm. And I still do and want to like incorporate that in the, my comedy. Yes. Like having level, a level four boss mm -hmm. is really a funny idea. Yeah, we're coming up on one of those. He's, Wait, a, are... he's a martial arts master and he is feeling vengeful. Are these we just We are going like, to see him soon. Are these just like... I think these are evil plants. They're like plants that are attacking us. Is the best way I could describe what these yeah. things are? They look like calligraphy. Yeah, they're very sort of abstract. This game is 20 years old. This is 20 years yeah, old? Yeah, this game is over 20 years old, and this is actually an updated graphics version oh. of it, but really, the graphics are not even that that much updated. You want to come up here, buddy? Why don't you come up? Um, and so, so there's definitely like a weird quality to it. I mean, the reason I'm playing the updated version is for some people, I think looking at the old one would be like, almost like looking at a cave painting. But anyway, <laughs> Donkey Kong is so magnificent, especially because he, when he's in the cart, he can jump, right? Yeah. But why? How can you jump when you're in a cart? They never explain that. But we just, when we play video games and these surreal yeah. things enter into the picture, we just, 
because we're trying to get from point A to point B, we just accept them. Yeah, but it also makes me nervous. Yeah. When he would jump in the cart, I'd be like, laws of gravity are not applying here. Absolutely. And I would always be like, why hasn't he shifted back? Mm -hmm. Uh so, and also there was a lot of things like cartoons always made me feel like kind of sick to my stomach. Yeah. Like I didn't, I don't like things being trapped in a space and I don't like, there's something about. It made you sick to your stomach because it was in a box of your TV? No, no. <laughs> no, I just always feel like cartoons are like, they're always in a house that never ends. Oh yeah. Like Tom and Jerry. Exactly. Like mm -hmm. Tom and Jerry. Yeah. Uh, also like Wile E. Coyote. I just don't, I can't handle it. I couldn't watch them go through this dog and pony show one more time. Mm -hmm. uh, some people think that, like, I've read I read a comic once, it was an issue of Animal Man, but basically the thesis of it was that Wile E. Coyote was Jesus, or represented Jesus because he dies over and over again and comes back to life. I, it, was, it was kind of a stretch, but... Who's uh, trying to kill Wile E. Coyote? Oh no, Wile E. Coyote is trying to eat he, the Roadrunner, uh, but yes. he keeps hurting himself in the process. Yeah. And the Roadrunner escapes scot-free. I don't know if that is the best analogy. Analogy. You could be right. I'd have to revisit it. I haven't looked at it in years, but it definitely ends with like Wiley e. Coyote going into the real world, getting hit by a car, actually dying, and laying out like Jesus. What? That's like the final episode. That's like the end of the comic. Yeah, Grant Morrison's Animal Man. Um, it's, it was heavy. Yeah. But uh, uh, so cartoons were a little bit terrifying. But what filmmakers? influenced you or made you what it was just this it was the act of filmmaking it wasn't even about other films you'd seen it was about this process of watching other people your sister skateboard yeah that's what got you i forgot it. the name of this author so i feel a little embarrassed but she wrote this essay online um mm -hmm. about women and uh women authors and who she writes for and that she recognized sort of late at a point into her she recognized when she had a child that her audience, whether or not she like, was willing to admit or really see it, was always white men. Like the authors that mattered to her, that she looked up to, she was always writing for them. Uh, and then and she those had... authors were white men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and why did I bring this up? Because you feel oh, like oh, all oh. filmmakers are white men. Sure, yes, I do, I definitely do, and that's something we can talk about. But because she had this really great passage in this essay, um, about one thing that she had always done her entire life. Like, she was like, I couldn't stick to sports. Like, she kind of listed all of these, like, hobbies we're supposed to get involved with as kids. Mm -hmm. And she was like, none of that really stuck, but one activity that I did do my entire life was watch boys do things. And I feel like I can, like, that connects really heavily for me about, like, oh, my sure. sister and skateboarding and watching, like, you know, watching my sisters, but watch people engage in, like, sort of prototypically, like, male activities is... I maybe that informed a little bit of. The well, of if all filmmakers are men, wouldn't it have to? Yeah. I can't it's crazy, think, isn't it? I, I mean, I feel like the films that mattered to me when I was a little kid were Clue. Okay. Uh, Great. Because that's an amazing movie. And uh, the way they showed it originally in theaters. How did they show it in theaters originally? Clue originally was screened, sent into theaters with three different versions of the movie and they didn't tell anyone and so depending on which one you saw you got a different ending every time so people would see the movie and try to spoil it or or not and then it would be ineffectual because the version that the other person got could have been something totally different that's so cool yeah and uh it's definitely one of the most exper experimental things Absolutely. hollywood's ever yeah, really yeah, done yeah. Um, and I don't think anything like that happens today. Um, Clue was important to mm -hmm. me. Jurassic Park was important to me. Sure. Um, uh, what's the movie about saving high schoolers? Dangerous Minds? I don't think I've ever seen that film. Who's in that Oh, film? it's really good. And I'm embarrassed that I can't remember who the lead is. Because hmm. she's like a famous... Actress. Actress. Um, that was an important movie to me. I don't know. I didn't have... I didn't have... I, I, neither of my parents were really... My dad worked in the entertainment industry, but neither of my parents were involved in film or the arts, really. So I didn't have a background where, like, people were 
showing me good things. Mm -hmm. And I had, like, my first, my experiences getting, like, giving myself my own education in filmmaking was just going to Blockbuster and going either to, like, the gay and lesbian section. Okay. Or, like, erotic section or foreign films. And then I would just pick something and my mom would look and be like, no. Nope. Or she'd be like, fine. And then that was how I got interested in maybe more experimental cinema or, like, international filmmaking or, um, interesting stuff. I mean, I think, I don't think they realized this at the time, but whoever is the, like, sort of, whoever was the curatorial person of Blockbuster <laughs> was really taking lives into their hands because they were just affecting, you know, like, but I'm a cheerleader was the only gay movie in my that Blockbuster. That was one of my first ones, too. And if that movie's actually good, I probably couldn't really tell you. I couldn't it, tell you either. It's probably not good. <laughs> but because it was, like, the first gay thing I saw, and because it opened up my mind so much... Okay, we're getting some drama here. Okay, so basically what happened was this guy this guy killed his... their karate master, and... Uh, this because guy he, is because, super hot. Which guy? This guy or this guy? This guy to the left. Who to has the a, left. Who has multiple purple ponytails. He's got multiple purple ponytails. He's feeling a little vengeful. And his body is, like... So rippled. I know it's crazy. It's what's what's fascinating to me about this game is they'll draw villains or characters that you face like this, but then who you actually play as is always these little guys. <laughs> like they, this is such a different human I know. body than this. They don't belong in the they same. They don't belong universe. in the same universe, but somehow they do. That's what I like sort of about Final Fantasy is that there's a mutability to just the general reality that's going on, which I guess is true of all cartoons. Maybe you would say, but uh. So you weren't really being given good stuff because your parents weren't creative. So it sounds like even throughout the process, even at CalArts, the experience of doing film was sort of just the medium and what you were more interested in was the message. Yeah, I, I've never been a person who's had like a great breadth of knowledge of filmmakers. Mm -hmm. I, I just So I try and focus on the things that always were important to me in film school were stories about women and stories by women, queer mm -hmm. filmmaking, and sure. coming of age stories about girls. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's like, those are sort of the things that grab me. Mm -hmm. And like, so an amount of experimental cinema. And, you know, like French New Wave is very fun. Sure. Um, and so... That's the stuff I gravitated towards. Um, and it's not to say that I make anything like that. No, I really like coming of age stories. And it's something like I, I try and write. I want to I wanna write eventually a, a coming of age story. Mm -hmm. That sounds pretty good. Yeah. So what about comics? Were there any comics that really influenced sister, you? Sister, my sister read comic books. I did not. I. Oh, well, we could talk about that. Oh, did you, did I you... meant uh, comedians. Oh, oh. Um, right now, I think maybe, er, like, early on, do you know Judy Tenuta? I know the name because it so pops into my head, but I don't remember exactly um, what her vibe was. Judy Tenuta is a world-class weirdo. Um, and my mom got, got, she would make us listen to her audio tapes when we'd go on car rides. She plays the accordion, and she had, like, her whole thing is to be, like, over the top obnoxious and she okay. has like a, a speaking voice and she sort of speaks like a piggy and talks mm -hmm. about being like a piggy a lot um and she's <laughs> it's really it's really fun and it's really like you like a second into it you're like i can't do this or you're like i'm on board mm -hmm. um so she's from chicago and i think she has sort of like it's like a little vaudeville so i would listen to that as a kid um and then um uh, this is weird. Smothers Brothers? Do you Smothers know the Brothers. Smothers Brothers? Our, I, our friend Megan Tryon, is she related to the Smothers Brothers? I have no I idea. I think she is. Is she really? Because I don't know who they are, but I know that they're connected to her That's somehow. That's so funny. I'm just going to turn the light on, but keep telling, yes. telling everyone who the Smothers Brothers is. Well, I don't know yeah, like my, my mom's... My mom's... Uh, father was was into musical theater and comedy and he produced a lot of it like that was his what's going on there i, I think we live beneath like a like a like a laundry or something oh. type five and they're like steaming things oh in there oh my gosh that is so cool and this weird steam comes into my room oh my goodness. i don't know if we could show that to the audience yeah. here let's just see if we can get a little sh get yeah. we can do shots here very cinematic this podcast you can kind of see it Oh, uh, it's not coming in as much. But anyway, yeah. yes, steaming does occur outside my apartment. Uh, so, okay, Smothers Brothers were, like, 
very, I don't, I don't know what kind of comedy it was. It's like nine, it's like 1940s oh, comedy. I see they, it, like, though. I see it in you a little bit. Where they, yeah, totally. It's embarrassing, but it's definitely it influences like how I talk. Um, where they would just, it was just two good old boys on stage, and they would do a lot of musical comedy and a lot of like who's on first kind of stuff. But is that them? That's not them. Who no, did they that? didn't do who's on first, but okay. I mean like they're sort of like repartee was like that. Like, you know, like they were always like banging around and messing things up and having, okay. to, and having to start over again and they like played instruments. But they were like, they still sort of stand up. Like I could still listen to them. It's really like wholesome and, and good natured too. Yes. Um, and they're like maybe an example of men that I can like sit through. Sure. Like male comedy. That's not yeah. entirely true. Anyway, um, so that was important to me. Yeah. And then um, Margaret Cho was the first big comedian that I discovered on my own mm -hmm. that like really spoke to me and blew me away and I'd listen to her stuff and cry. And I got interested in her when I was probably 15. And cry. Oh yeah. Cry laughing or cry? Both. Yeah. Like, because she talked a lot about like eating disorder stuff and body image stuff. Uh -huh. I mean she just oh, yeah. she went into the whole like canon of like shitty young girl issues. Yeah. And I was like, really, really, really? Uh, so that that was really, she was really important to me. And um, also that she spoke about sex and sexuality and rape and just ev like everything. Fearless, really. Fearlessly and, um, and I thought that was really brave and I think it helped me kind of process and go through a lot of stuff. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so Margaret Cho, um, and then... I got retweeted by Margaret Cho once. Did you really? Bragging right now. But what, do you remember true. what the tweet was? Oh, just something. It was about Margaret Cho. I said something like, America doesn't deserve Margaret Cho, but we do need her, or something like oh, that. Oh, that's really nice. I was like... That's a nice little capsule. I was like, of... whoa, Margaret Cho and me are existing in the same universe yeah, right now. Yeah, you are. Twitter can kind of do that. It My can. friend just got retweeted by Maria Bamford. That's cool. Um, and But I think it was a similar, like, she was just talking about how great Maria Bamford is. And Maria yeah. Bamford was like, yeah. Um, which I like. Uh, Maria Bamford is a huge, huge person to me. She's very yeah, important. Absolutely. She's probably the most important comedian to me thus far. Um, and yeah, when I I, I I started listening to her maybe four years ago, mm -hmm. and then I've just watched her career take off, and it's been like really. I feel like I feel very emotional about it. I think like she's really incredible, and I think she's sort of she's changing comedy in, in pretty big ways. And I also think that she's bringing in like I mean I just I think uh, being a person with like significant mental health issues of my own like it's <laughs> sick enough. It's uh, it's really incredible the kind and, of work she's doing. And Margaret, uh, not Margaret Cho, Maria Bamford has mental health issues. I don't really know Absolutely. enough about her personal like, deal. Yeah, she, I mean she talks talk a about lot about. about like she. She kind of does this nice play between like talking very. She she will she will wrap up what goes on with her really well into a joke. So you kind of have a moment. You're like, did she just say she's bipolar? She did. She did. Yeah. But like she done she's done it in she done it in a real clever way. Yeah. Uh, and how how has she, I because I'm familiar with some of Maria Bamford's comedy, um, doing impressions of people on like million dollar listing shows talking about their houses. But what uh. Has she started doing any, like, movies or TV, or has she just taken off as a she, comic? She did, um, she had a bit role in, um, not Kirby, uh, Arrested Development. Okay. And they did their, like, final Oh, yes, season. I remember that, as, uh, the Invisible Woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was and her character's name on that? It was such a funny name. I can't remember. It was her hilarious. name was, like, Tawny. <laughs> yeah. <Right? laughs> oh, man, she's good. Guys, who are these little squirrels? I don't know. I mean, we're just out in the world right now. We beat the boss. We beat the muscly guy that you had a crush on. Sure. The thing that I always wonder and think about in these moments, like when they disappear like this, like they're about to do, like here comes a guy disappear. I bet he's gonna disappear. Is he dead right now? Did I just kill that little raccoon? I feel or, like it's sort of ambiguous. Yeah. Or did he just sort of? Back did he just shooped back into the ground, or he just yeah. disappeared, or he just gave up, or? I mean, it's not, it's not completely, it's really, like, unclear, like, the... I don't like that she is just walking into land masses, and then now we're in another place. Because it's not clear to me that's an entrance. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think, part of the 20 years old problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, it looks like, it, it looks, like, to normal people, this looks like, this looks like a cave painting. I, like, not, 
not this, but like the original, original version, like, like, it just, like, like this, it just seems completely uninterpretable to you. Why do you keep, why do you keep referencing this manual? Because this is telling me how to play the game. It's but a strategy guide. But don't you know from doing this almost constantly? I don't want to miss a thing. I don't want to miss a thing, Lauren. Because this is a let's play. We're trying to teach the children how to be Final Fantasy today. We haven't done a lot of that so far. <laughs> it's all been happening right here. There, what, what will they be watching? They'll be watching me get through the game. Oh, and then us in the corner? And then us in the corner. See, I'm not a very good filmmaker. No, you're... Well... <laughs> well, that's good then, because now you're in comedy. That's right. I'm you're on, in the world no, of I'm comedy. comedy. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about uh, about women and... and um, the insanity of, 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 you know, all, because you said uh, most comics and most of comedy is white guys. Thank you for handing me this. <laughs> yeah, I was done with it. Which I, of course, am, so. I don't, I mean, I don't, I actually don't believe most of comedy is white guys. Okay. I think there's a strong, like, there's a strong history that's maybe unheard of, or it's, right. it's not sung enough. There's hidden history. There's a long, but, there's a long history yeah. of women, and, and, uh, of women doing comedy, and of course, like a lot of really powerful, important, momentous people of color doing comedy. Oh yeah, and it's not so. It's not the history of white dudes. It, it's stuff. it's not. There's definitely there's definitely yeah. some serious exceptions, even in the yeah. in the main frame. But like those are uh, exceptions, right? Yeah. We use the term yeah. exceptions, uh, to spe especially when you're talking about women. Women are more than half of people. Yeah. Uh. So. Yeah. So. When they get contextualized as a minority, then we've really got a problem, right? Yeah, we've yeah. really, we've really got a serious issue I on our hands. I didn't actually know that. Whoops. Didn't know which. That women are more than half of people. I mean, there are more women born than men, as yes. I understand it. Yeah, women are the majority, I, scientifically. You know your stuff. You know st your statistics. Let's hope so. Let's hope I'm not just, <laughs> you know, making stuff up over here on this Final Fan. I mean, it's really important when you're playing Final Fantasy to have all your biological facts. In the, about the universe completely right. Yeah, you have to have those straight. Um, so these guys up here, just to take a break. Let's absolutely take a break because we're getting into some serious plot points here. Basically, the way this, what this game is about is there's the, the government, okay, the government, the government. They're trying to reverse engineer magical creatures to create weapons. We are the returners, this little crew we're seeing here, who are resisting the government. She has magic powers, and no one understands why. There hasn't been magic in the world for hundreds of years. Wow. So now we have just gotten here to Bannon, or as a kid I always pronounce it, Bannon. I don't know why. Mm. French. <laughs> French. Who's the leader of the Returners, and here we go with a little plot point. So this is the girl, the one to whom the Esper responded. Ask some questions. Is this her? That's her? That's her, yeah. Okay, so something I like is when we have this whatever tableau up the, here the, the they are like the they are illustrated in a completely different way mm -hmm. reality is and mutable it's like really funny that it almost feels to me like we don't have the time or energy here so we can do it up there like does that yes well at the time of this what? game's creation they didn't have the technology to do it down here and sure. they could only do it up here yeah when they did it up here then it looked even like this looks like way more I mean, when they did it up there, then it looked like more like the artist who designed all these characters was very influenced by Gustav Klimt. So the oh. older drawings, you can sort of see it here yeah, yeah. in some of this patterning. Um, it's like fish. And here, you know, the, the little circles. Yes, I also named all these characters after uh, dear personal friends from throughout my life. Oh, you can name them. Yeah, you can name them. I know who Bertel is. Yes. But Banan. Banan, he's not a playable character, so we can't so even. You him. can't I'd change him. But, uh, yeah, I love the face changing because it makes, it's like that thing I was saying. It's like, there's no clear version of reality in this world. There's drawings, there's these drawings, yeah. there's whatever. And they're there's all, all simultaneously weird stuff. existing. And they're all simultaneously existing. Yeah. And that's part of what I like this game is that the main character is, uh is female. That was the first for the series. Okay, so who is watching this podcast? Is it people who want to know more about this game? It's a combination, I think. It's a combination. Because they're going to be like, was this a comedian? She wasn't very funny. Oh, I don't think that's the... Well, I don't know. But I, that's always how I feel when people, like, approach me to talk about comedy. It's like, I'm not, like, I ha, like... I didn't approach you to do stand-up. No. I approached you to talk about your life yes. moments that you're There's, going through. But it's so much pressure. 
It is pressure. It's pressure when... Would you say it's a pressure when you are considered to be a comedian to always be funny? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's not even like... I'm not... I don't, I don't consider myself a comedian yet because I don't do stand-up. I do all these other like... I have all okay. these other ways of doing it because Improv. I'm very scared of stand-up. But um, but if other... If, if somebody else called me that, then I'm like, fuck. Uh... And so, and also like when you're in when you're in a conversation about comedy or this other funny things happens when people ask me like what do you do and I'm like well I do comedy I do this and that and like if it's a dude they're always like yeah I do comedy too I do comedy too uh -huh. and I'm also a producer and I'm also a director uh -huh. and I'm uh, doing some entrepreneurial work sure and uh, but I do comedy also what kind of comedy do you like and it's like I don't know what that question is that is a weird question what kind of comedy do you like this is the kind of stuff Maria Bamford takes apart and like gorgeous ways yeah i mean i the only way i can ever answer that question is by saying like people that i really enjoy um good response uh because i can't quantify comedy yeah who was didn't they say i always remember in like high school stupid people would say things like you know there's only three different types of humor or comedy do you remember people saying stuff like that mm. i don't know that sounded like the biggest what bullshit were they what were life. people telling you i don't know it was like times? something to do with shakespeare i don't even know why i'm bringing this up but uh yeah, those were the theater kids, and they had some real bombastic. They had some bombastic. Movies. But were you in that? You were in theater in of high course, school. Of course, Yeah. Uh, yeah, I did theater, and I did musical theater, which I actually miss a lot. Uh, so now I just do karaoke, and then pray that somebody will be like, "I'm a representative of a label, and I really, huh. I really liked what you just did." With You're a fabulous singer. I've heard you sing. Betty Davis eyes. Sing uh, karaoke many times, and I've always really been blown away by your um, like professionalism. Thank you. That's so sweet. Uh, being a I singer. I really like to put on a show. You really do. I mean, yeah. I remember. I remember one time doing karaoke with you. I mean, it was at like a big bar where there was like lots of different karaoke. Like it wasn't like we were in a room and we could do a million songs. We each pretty much could only do one song. Yeah. And. Uh, and you showed up a little late, and so, um, like... I'm worried about where this you, story would be going. We, we had to wait a long time to listen to you sing, essentially. Or we were, If we wanted to stay to hear you sing, we would have to stay a long time. And I was like, no, we should stay. It's going to be good. Oh! And then it was, it was absolutely <laughs> wait, fabulous. Was this, in, was this in Burbank? I yeah, we were, like, somewhere not where I'd ever been before. Because there was a really cute, like, group of queers that used to do... Uh, it was definitely kind of gay. Uh, uh, what, I don't know. This place called like Midnight Something, and Amy Gogan was like the yeah. She was the one who that... like had told us about it. Though. Yeah. She wasn't there that night, but no. night, but she's well, the one who. Well, thank you for um, encouraging people to it. stick around for yeah. my performance. Because it's a kind of performance that I don't otherwise get to indulge in, and it's truly therapeutic for yeah. me. When I'm very upset about things, I'll, Singing. Go, do, I'll go do karaoke by Singing. myself. It's yeah. a cutter. I, I sing so much. Do you? It, it's funny being as someone who's a singer and not using it as a regular talent. Sometimes you feel like, oh, maybe I should be doing more music right now, you know, other than just screaming into my computer. But I never feel that way, actually. It's like it's it's compartmentalized. Like my musical things go directly into karaoke, and that's the only place I exercise them. Or like I sing in my car a whole lot. I also talk a lot in my car. Do you talk? You don't drive. I don't drive. I haven't driven in like two years. It's crazy. Where do you get to talk to yourself alone? Yeah, I do it. Only I do do it in the shower. I've gotten busted for doing it. I've gotten busted for doing it. I also <laughs> pace like a cat sometimes. Do you have conversations with people who aren't there to yourself? Mm, can't say I go that far. Do you go that far? Absolutely. I can't control it. Mm -hmm. I will like I, if I'm especially if I'm angry with a person, I start to like I'm in first I'm in my head and then it starts to get out loud and I'm like yeah well, just so you know and then like and then it escalates into me like I always end up giving speeches to them mm -hmm. and then I've like really showed them what's what yeah uh, and um, it's like a little horrifying to maybe admit that here in front of an audience of how, I don't know how many people how many people are gonna watch this is yeah, that the question yeah. I don't really know yet. Uh, the so, first one we put up about a week ago and has a hundred views, I think. Huh. Um, Tell me more about the statistics. <laughs> well, this is what I've been discovering is that a lot of people live in India and some of them truly, truly. play Final Fantasy and maybe some of them are gay. I mean, I know some of them are gay. I don't know if they're all, I don't really know anything about gay rights in India, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, 
but they are enjoying, um, they're enjoying what I'm doing so yeah. far. Yeah, yeah. That's what I know. So am I. But the thing is, oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. But the thing is, this will sit on the internet for a while. <laughs> And yes, here's the Antone looks just like him. It does. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's just sitting on the internet for a while, and uh, and these videos can accrue continuously because people will look at them whenever they need a little help getting through the game. But I feel like I need a little help because I don't know who I'm supposed to be talking to right now. Is it this guy? Oh! If we force our ideas on you, we're no different from the Empire. See, there's some nice little... Some nice little messages in yeah, here. Don't yeah. force your ideas on people. Yeah. Well, Lauren, do you have it? Makes you know better than you know whatever system's oppressing you. That's what I like about this game. I like the anti-weaponry stance, even though of course we are like fighting you have things with monsters. You have arrows. Oh, I mean, we're fighting with swords and stuff, but the Empire is trying to like do all kinds of crazy stuff. Maybe it's this. Oh, this is cool. Eye drops. Eye drops to heal us when we get blinded. Oh my God. Here's darkness. Do we have any? We could get some eye drops. I like going. sleeping bag is one of them. Sleeping bag is good. Sleeping bag heals you. What's uh, a, oh. a tent is a little better than sleeping bag. What's a tent? Tent is oh uh it basically heals everyone in your group. Oh whoops. Oh, no. A certain amount of all their life, all their health back, and a certain amount of their magic points. Essentially, what a tent does. But uh, so the tent is good. Bet through here is where we're trying to go. Lauren, what uh, do you have coming up? What are you trying to plug? <laughs> um, I so my girl crush, the group that I'm in, mm -hmm. is doing a series of workshops to the Women's Center for, for Creative Work in in Frogtown, and they are beginning in January. I wish I had the dates. I I should know the dates of these things. It begins in January. It goes through February, and then we have a show on the 19th of February. And if you've taken the class, you open for us. And it's oh, really cool. fun. It's for all levels. It's for people who feel like they're performers and people who don't. Uh, we make a very safe space. It's for guys and girls and anything you identify as uh, outside of that or in between. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Please take our workshop. You'll have a blast. We're a lot of fun. Uh, who all else is in the group? It's stupid cheap considering what improv classes cost. And um, Sally Merkel, CalArts alum, Jenny Greer, CalArts alum, both theater department grad students. But Sally Merkel, oh, theater department, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, what I'm plugging. Um, and obviously, future performative collaborations between you and I. Oh, yes. Uh, that's one thing our audience should know. Uh, me and Lauren have been working on some, some, a little theater of our own. Yeah. Involving uh, ex virgins. That's right. Yeah, yeah. that's right. That's right. Um, so. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. It has been too much good stuff. It's been a pleasure. All right. Okay. You have a great day. Okay. You have a great day. I'm trying to figure out what the best way is to end these. Oh, you know what? This you is know how what you did. should do? You should lean in like we're going to kiss real close and then it cuts off. You that's know, pretty good. A nice way to. That's a pretty good way to end it. Make your audience uncomfortable, which is important in comedy. Wait right here, just hang out with me for a minute more because maybe we're going to get to save right now. Oh no, we have to get into this whole plot point. Let's just get through this. Okay. Let's get to a save point. We all know that the Gestalian Empire is using, using its Magitek power to wage war. Don't the like how that word's spelled. Which one? Magitek. Yeah. The question is, where did they get that power? I had Anton dig around for <laughs> information. It seems the Empire has been gathering scholars from around the world to study espers. Anton. Narsh's Esper was also the reason for the Imperial assault there. Are you saying there's some kind of connection between Esper's and Magitek? Esper's and Magitek? Only one possible link comes to mind. You don't mean the War of the Magi. No, that's impossible. My grandma used to tell me bedtime stories about magical machines. <laughs> Those stories were true? You're saying we're on the verge of a second War of the Magi? It's only a guess. The war took place a thousand years ago, and every historian has a different theory. But one theory says that energy drained from espers was used to power machines, and that ordinary humans were also infused with that same energy. So that's what Magitek power is. If we're going to fight Magitek enemies, we need Magitek weapons of our own. No! That would bring about another war of the Magi. Then what do you propose? I was wondering if we might not be able to have a chat with an esper. With an esper? Espers are like magical creatures. It's sure. risky, but that esper reacted to Ada before. If we could get it to react to her again, we just might be able to wake it up. Do you really think that would work? 
Worth like all these worth people moving around, yeah. thinking. All yeah. of these, like, they look like Amelia Earhart. They do look like him. For a second, I thought you were going to say Amelia Bedelia. Do you remember those books? <laughs> I do. I loved Amelia Bedelia. Actually, I did not. She's a she little was, bit too, too literal. She's a little... Yeah, she was She was actually, like, insufferable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would not like to have her around. It's kind of, uh... Wasn't she also Christian? Was she sort of... I feel like there's something vaguely religious. I feel like Amelia Bedelia had been in a cult and, like, hadn't... She, like, just didn't understand yeah, she social just, mores. She, she just like, just... She was completely clueless about everything. She needed to get it together. She needed to get it together. She was always getting in, like, pickles, for instance, you know? Mmm. Oh, that's dramatic. Highly expositional. I like that this guy just <laughs> is, like, dead. Floored. I know someone has to sneak to South Figaro to slow down the enemy. I bet that's going to be him because he's, like, a thief. This is right up your alley. We're counting on you. Okay, he's off to do that. Otto, wait for me. I won't be gone long. And watch out for a certain lecherous young king who shall remain nameless. Who's that? Bertle. The guy moves <laughs> in like a hawk. <laughs> Anton! Bertle, old habits die hard, eh? What about us? We can escape down the Lathe River and make our way to Narsh. I'm curious about that esper they found in the mines. Very well, I'll ready the raft by the back entrance. Oh, right, you have to ride a raft. It's risky, but we don't have much of a choice at this point. Well, this is like a fun level. It's not safe here. Come with us to Narsh. It could be a chance for you to gain a better understanding of your abilities. We've no time to dilly-dally. Let's make for Narsh. Ooh, dilly-dally. That's not a word I've heard in a while. Yeah. That also seems sort of out of place in the language they use here. Definitely out of place. This is a relatively newer translation, uh, as I understand it. Huh. Here we go, this raft will carry us to Narsh. Hop That's... aboard the raft. You know what? No. I want to see if I can save first before I get into all that. Save the game. Save the game. Here we certainly may. Alright, let's. this is how we should end it. Let's end it with a little selfie. A mm -hmm. little selfie that I can turn into promotional materials. Yeah, I like that a lot. Alright, let's get this going here. You have 43 text messages. Yeah. That's unbelievable to It's me. not good. What's going on? What hap What occurs is not good. How are you feeling about the lighting? I think it's nice. I think it's nice, too. I don't think I need the headphones. Okay. Mm -hmm. One, two, three. Let's do a couple more. Awesome. That's really nice. Thank you so much Thank for coming you. on the show, Lauren. Thank you for having this me. This has been another episode of Let's Gay. I'm Johnny Jungle Guts, the Top Notch Gamer. Tune in soon. We're going to have new episodes up every week. Bye. Bye. If I can find the mouse.